So monthly space news, roughly the last month or so, a lot about the moon. You might say it's a full moon because we had one craft land there, one did crash there, and we have one that's coming. It's been launched. So we'll get right to the moon here. First, the one that crashed, that was the Russian one. Luna 25, they failed an orbit maneuver. They had some kind of a problem where one of their engines fired too long. And as a result, they braked too hard and they ended up crashing early. So that fell short of their landing spot. They didn't make it. So that one, it was the one that was nuclear powered. It would have lasted a long time had it actually made it there properly. Now, the good news is India lander did make it. Chandrayaan-3, which sounds like it might be in some kind of a god's name or something. Actually, it means moon vehicle in Hindi. The good news is it did land successfully on August 23rd, which makes it the first spacecraft near the lunar south pole. Most of them have been more mid-latitudes for a variety of reasons, partially because it's flat in some of the other areas, and this is a little bit more risky. It's only on solar power, so as a result, their design life is really just 14 days. You know, how long does a lunar day last? And then you have 14 uh, Earth days worth of night. It may or may not make it through that. It's already made it through the first day. They went ahead and put everything to sleep. And that's really two different things. There's the lander itself, which has a lot of instrumentation, and there's a rover, which was deployed and has moved around. They independently will both try to wake back up at sunrise. They're not really necessarily expecting them to. 14 days is a long time to go in bitter, bitter cold with no power. Anyway, India, though, is now the fourth country to have achieved a soft lunar landing. Several others have achieved very hard landings. They don't count as much. Um, and the other thing that was really notable is that the whole mission it only cost about $90 million U.S. The Indians have really staked out their position as they really know how to do very advanced kind of technology very, very cheaply. So they are definitely establishing themselves as a premier space power at this point. Okay, I'll have a visualization of what that looked like in a little more detail. You can see the lander there in the center of the picture. There's the ramp where the rover came down. And as we pointed out last time, since you're at the lunar poles, you pretty much have to have your solar cells vertical because the sun is all coming in almost horizontally. That was just a visualization. This is the actual lander. This is a view from the lander taking a picture showing the deployment of the rover. From that rover, then they took a picture back, and this, this is what the lander looks like. So fundamentally, the main purpose of all this initial round of robotic landings is pretty much to demonstrate the technology for landing safely, deploying rovers, and that sort of thing. The follow-ups, the ones that'll do a lot more of the prospecting and scientific research kind of stuff, but all of them are doing typically um, some analysis. They're all going to accomplish something, but the biggest single thing is saying, we can do this, and we can do it robotically. Now, also, Japan has launched a moon lander during this time. This is from the Japanese space agency, JAXA. The X stands for exploration. But when you see JAXA, they basically think of it as a Japanese NASA. Um, now, this follows two Japanese failures previously. One of them was a private company, iSpace, the Hukuro R failure. We covered that in quite a bit of detail in some of our previous news. This also, though, followed the failure of the uh, Omotenashi, which is a very, very tiny probe, only 31 pounds. This one we tend to forget about because it kind of got lost in the, uh, the excitement over the Artemis I mission. It was a rideshare. There were 10 little CubeSats that were deployed along with the main mission to go flying around the moon. But a lot of those missions had a problem in that typically those CubeSats sat there for about three years because things kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed on taking off. And by the time they finally took off, the batteries had run down. In this case, they finally concluded that one of the main problems they had was seals had degraded on their valves. And as a result, propellant leaked and got places they shouldn't, and they couldn't control it. And as a result, they couldn't get the solar cells oriented right, and they pretty much lost contact. There may have been battery problems also, which would have made it worse, but they couldn't have run on battery power as well. And some people think that may be true. Some people don't. Anyway, that little thing remains in orbit. Okay. SLIM is the name of the lander that was just launched. It stands for Smart Lander for Investigating Moon. Also, it, they call it the Moon Sniper. And the reason for that is they're really emphasizing pinpoint landing. And by that, they mean landing within 100 meters of the target, which is really quite impressive. The only time anyone has ever done anything like that before was on asteroids, and that was the Japanese again, actually. But they point out that it's pretty easy to go into asteroids. There's no gravity pulling you in, you know, so you have plenty of time to get it right. You can back up a little bit if you need to and try again. When you got something like the moon pulling you down, you don't have much room for error. So it's hard to do. Even our Mars lander, I think it probably landed within a couple of kilometers of its target. The Apollo missions, they landed within maybe 13 kilometers. I mean, 
this is really, really what they're calling precision landing. And that, that is actually part of the point of this is that we want to land where we want to land. And for instance, places like the Lunar South Pole, it's kind of rough down there. There's a lot of craters and boulders and things. And really, we want to be able to land in tough to land in spots. And so they're, they're really developing that technology. Now, where they're going um, is interesting. is an impact crater. It's not at the Lunar South Pole. The reason they're going there is that they are going to be analyzing the regolith, and they will be analyzing the composition of it, mainly for clues to the moon's formation. The mantle there is exposed because it's an impact crater, so it was probably still molten at some point, and it's been exposed, and they're hoping to learn more as a result of that. Now, this thing is definitely bigger than their previous effort, uh, 200 kilograms dry, so 400, you know, 400 some pounds. Dry meaning no fuel. If you put the fuel in there, there's 730 kilograms. This was launched on September 6th, and it'll take about four months to get there. It's a really long roundabout path, but it's much more energy efficient. Um, <coughs> landing in early 2024, they'll be orbiting the moon for about a month, just taking pictures and making sure they know exactly where they want to land. What's interesting is this is actually a rideshare. This is the secondary mission. The main mission of this particular launch is actually an X-ray space telescope, and it's the latest generation. People like to do X-ray space telescopes because you can't really see the x-rays through the Earth's atmosphere. So you can learn a lot about plasmas and, and various things going on out there. And like others, this has a, a lifetime of 14 days, 14 Earth days, meaning about one lunar day. And then maybe it'll make it through the night, maybe not, it remains to be seen. Okay, the orbit. This is a relatively complex. What's interesting is there are lots and lots of ways to get to the moon at low energy. They all take a lot of time, which is why any of the uh, human missions, of course, don't do this sort of thing. But everyone does it a little bit differently. Sort of left of center here, you have the Earth, where we're coming from. You got the moon over here on the left-hand side, and the orbit of the moon is shown here. So the path is, it gets up to uh, orbit or just around the Earth. At the point when it's closest to Earth, it does an extra burn. And by doing that, it's the most efficient way to raise your altitude, and that's what they're doing. If you believe the that the lines here are accurate. They're only doing one extra burn to get a little extra altitude here. That's different than the Indian uh, craft. When they did this, they did it about like four or five times. Each time when they got to the minimum uh, distance to Earth, you know, they, they did another burn. And as a result, they kept making bigger and bigger um, orbits around the Earth. So finally, they're getting close enough that they could send off to uh, the moon. Now, in the Indian case, then they just went right to the moon. And that's not what's going on here. Here instead, they're shooting for the moon, yes, but they're really just doing it to get a gravity assist. And that's what's shown here. The actual final pass swings way, way out, actually way past the orbit of the moon. This is pretty much what Akuto R did, but they didn't do that intermediate gravity assist. So everybody does this differently. They're introducing some new technology. The crater they're going for, their landing area is sloped about 15 degrees, which makes it harder to land. So they're doing something kind of clever. What they're doing is they're hovering and then they're tipping themselves forward. They're gonna bounce on the front legs and then they're gonna go and land on the back and finally stabilize themselves. So it looks like they're coming down vertically, but they end up in kind of a horizontal position, a little, little different approach. But what they're saying is, we're gonna to need to learn how to do this sort of stuff because it's hard to land only where it's flat. You know, the places you wanna go, like Lunar South Pole, there might not be too many really flat spots. So come up with something that will work. Now, I'm not sure how well this would work for a really, really large craft. I mean, it's kind of hard to imagine the uh, Starship. You know, <laughs> but then again, it's kind of hard to imagine the Starship landing on a 20 degree slope or something, too. So it remains to be seen how larger ships are going to be doing this. But anyway, they're experimenting with this kind of technology. Now, they are landing with a lot of sensors to make sure that they will never lose their way because they lost a sensor. Unlike Hakuto R, where actually they thought they lost a sensor, they didn't, but as a result, they couldn't land properly. They actually have a lot of ways of measuring the altitude. They have radar, standard kind that measures around trip. You know, you get a ping and it comes back and you can time it. You know how long the distance is. But also you can get a, the, the velocity. You can get your velocity relative to the moon surface based on the frequency shift, the Doppler effect. And just like the weather radar uh, does on Earth. Um, you get an idea about whether the you know, things are moving toward you or away from you. And they have laser range finders, and they can actually just land optically just with the cameras. So they have all those things. They could lose quite a bit of instrumentation and still be able to land and autonomously avoid obstacles. So they will, in fact, even near the end, they kind of hover around to make sure, absolutely sure, there's nothing in the way, and then they just they drop down.
So their tagline is, we're going to go from the era of landing where we can to landing where we want. That, and that's, that's, they think that's their claim to fame here. Now, they have a couple of probes, and it's hard to call these rovers. These are a little different. The first one here for Lunar Excursion Vehicle 1, they actually eject that right before they land. They just shoot it off to the side. It's a hopper. It's not actually a rocket, per se. I think it's a mechanical thing. It, they're planning on having that thing jump around about six times. It's a mechanical thing. Um, it mainly has cameras, but it does have some instrumentation, measuring temperature, radiation, and the incline. And they have direct-to-earth communications. I don't know how they squeeze all that in, in that little package. It's only a couple of pounds, well, four pounds, roughly. But they have all that in there, and they show pictures of what it should look like if you can kind of hop around. Um, and then they have a separate one, which is even much, much smaller. It's only 250 grams, roughly half a pound. And it was designed by a toy company uh, in, in collaborating also with Sony and a Japanese university. It's about a little larger than a tennis ball. And it's a sphere, but what it does is it opens up and it has levers that stick out and they kind of move around. So it probably doesn't go very fast. But the point is it could go almost anywhere, um, you know, with, with enough lever there to stop themselves from rolling when they don't want to. So it's another experiment kind of a thing. And it really just has cameras, um, no other instruments. Now there's two NASA-sponsored probes, robotic launches, that are coming up pretty soon. The first one is going to be intuitive machine. They're going to be landing near the South Pole, and that's the one with the picture to the right here. They think they'll be ready to ship to the launch site in September for integration and final testing. So it's, it's getting pretty close. Now, they're going on a Falcon 9, and the uh, launch for that is set up to be between November 15th and November 30th. And there's always reasons why that might not happen, but at least that's the primary window. They have a backup window in December, so it seems pretty likely they may get this launch off this year. Now, Astrobotic, they've had their craft ready for a while. Uh, they've been waiting, but they've been waiting for the United Launch Alliance to finish the Vulcan rocket, which has really been waiting on the engine from um, the origin. So they've actually just been victimized in a way by not having a rocket ready because they didn't pick the company that could actually go. But according to the current schedule, they still might go in December of this year. So that remains to be seen. It really depends more on the Vulcan rocket than anything else. Uh, now, both of these are under NASA contracts called CLIPS, which stands for Commercial Lunar Payload Services, where NASA doesn't really buy a rocket and do something with it. It pretty much buys the service of getting there. And so they've arranged certain things to be done, uh, transfer of materials and you know, things. So all this is happening. Again, this first round is focused mainly on just being able to land because it's not easy to land on the moon. You know, unlike Mars, you don't even have an atmosphere. You know, to slow you down. You know, parachutes don't work. Um, so it actually is harder to land there than other places. Now, there's another Japanese lander coming along, and this is essentially the second version of the Hakuto R mission. That's the one that had failed before, and it's not going to look that different. They will have their own rover instead of the one built by the United Arab Emirates, and they are planning some experiments. They're going to be splitting water on the lunar surface. So we've always had this theory that it sounds simple. You know, you just electrolyze water, you get hydrogen and oxygen, and we can use that for rocket fuel. But we haven't actually done it, you know. And so it's time somebody actually does some of it. Um, they're also testing out some food production. So they're finally getting into some of the actual experiments that are needed as a way to, you know, to get people, ultimately to get people living on the moon, but certainly producing fuel and that sort of thing. Um, now, by the way, so this picture here shows the lander. This is the rover down here on, on the bottom. It's not like a giant metal thing here. Those are the tire tracks. Okay, change the topic here. Amazon's Project Kuiper. Every now and then they make it into the news. They tend to work kind of quietly, but they're a competitor for Starlink, basically a satellite-based internet. They haven't put anything up in the air yet. Uh, they're still waiting on that. But their plan is to have over 3,000 uh, satellites in low Earth orbit. That's their claim to fame, and every now and then you hear from them. For instance, they've sued the government a couple times for not uh, giving them contracts and that sort of thing. This time, their news is they're getting sued. They're getting sued for not using SpaceX for launches, which is kind of ironic. Um, but basically, it's a pension fund that owns some of their stock, and they're saying they're suing Amazon, the board of directors, and Jeff Bezos for failing in their fiduciary duty. Why? Well, first of all, if they had contracted some of their launches to SpaceX, it probably would have been a lot cheaper. But more importantly, there's availability. They've contracted, spent a lot of money, somewhere between five and $10 billion, signing up with virtually every other competitor for launch. The catch is that none of those rockets actually existed yet, not one of them. They had initially some contracts to put some things up with old Atlas rockets, and that's about it. 
But for going forward, they were depending on three. One of them is the Vulcan, which is it's coming along soon, hopefully, but it's still not ready. The Ariane 6 uh, European entry, and then the new Glenn from Blue Origin. The fact that they didn't even consider launching on SpaceX, they say that's kind of questionable because they need to get half of their satellites up by 2027 and the other half by 2029. And it's going to get tougher and tougher to do that, given that they haven't even gotten one up there yet. I mean, they might find out that they have to completely redesign it. You know, I mean, they're just, you know, time is really running out. Anyway, the, the reason they're suing is they're saying you could have gotten going a lot sooner if you'd simply done some launch on SpaceX. The question is, is it a conflict of interest for Jeff Bezos, who is on the board of directors? Now, he doesn't really run Amazon, but he's still on the board of directors. And he obviously clearly influences it a lot. It benefits him because Bezos owns Blue Origin, which is the rocket company. Amazon is not in the rocket business at all. They want to be in the satellite business, but they're not launched. So for them to say, okay, we're going to launch with Blue Origin or on the Vulcan rocket that has Blue Origin engines, basically Blue Origin makes more money and hence enriching Bezos. That's the claim. What's interesting is that actually every other competitor for Starlink has already used SpaceX. I had to go back and look at this. I couldn't believe it. But OneWeb, which is direct competition for Starlink, they've actually, ever since the Russians fell out of the picture, everybody had to scramble and they all just went to SpaceX. SES, which actually is the other main competitor, there's a network called Other 3 Billion, O3B, which is supposed to be you know yet another uh, competitor here. That is actually the, the only other main one that's the most like Starlink, except they're at medium Earth orbit. They're up a little bit higher, so they don't need so many satellites. But anyway, and then Iridium, they've been in the space telephone business for a long time. And the newer competitors, Link and EST Space Mobile, they're the ones that are doing direct satellite to your standard phone. They all, they've all gone with launching on SpaceX. So really everybody except Telsat and DirecTV, they're the only two, but they haven't launched anything lately. So it wasn't really an issue for them. The thing is, it's an easy economic choice. Why did Musk even want to have Starlink in the first place? The main reason is that the revenue you get from satellite services totally dwarfs the revenue you can get by launching. You know, he needed more money. If you want to actually fund getting to Mars, you need a big business to do that. Well, the way to do that was create a big business, which is in this case, a you know, satellite internet business. So just by being delayed even a year or two, that's a huge amount of revenue that's lost. And so that's kind of the point in this lawsuit is that economically, everybody else made the economic decision. They said, okay, yeah, sure, we're funding a competitor a little bit because of that little bit of launch money, but really we're gonna make a lot of money selling satellite services. And so economically it was an easy decision. So the, the lawsuit comes down to, is it just poor decision-making on the part of Amazon or is it actually a conflict of interest? You know, and that'll drag on for years probably. It's, it's a, Okay, separate topic. You know, we all know that there's a big problem with orbital space debris. You have dead satellites, you have ones that uh, have broken up for one reason or another. You have upper stages of rockets that are still floating around up there. So everybody wants to do something about that, but nobody's really done much yet. Well, there's a new approach here. Use a big bag. This has actually been thought about. We talked about a company called TransAstra that was developing bags, but they were doing something different. They were doing it for asteroid mining. They were saying they want to go out and capture an asteroid, and then they're going to basically blast it with very, very uh, hot sunlight, you know, focused very, very tightly to like three or 4,000 degrees, vaporize it, get the water out of it, and mine for water, you know, essentially, and then other things later on. But the first target was water. So they had already been developing a technology for basically capturing an asteroid, putting it in a bag. In this case, this was intended, this particular picture was their planned future one, which would be a, roughly a house-sized asteroid. That's what this one was. But in the meantime, this company has gone out and said, well, okay, we can do uh, space re you know, removal as well. We can get rid of old dead satellites just as easily. So that's what they're doing. They got a rewarded uh, phase two small business innovative research uh, grant from NASA for this. So this was the work that they had been doing. Their initial demo was gonna be a fairly small thing up in, if, I think it hasn't happened yet, but it's, it's probably happening next year. We covered this back in February, uh, 2023, where you have a much smaller craft it was going to go out and grab, in this case, it was a simulated asteroid, which is basically just a black circle. You can see the craft coming at it. It's hard to tell, but that is actually a bag with inflatable struts. And then if you look at the sort of the picture on the right here, it's showing you how then it would clamp down. And it all is just basically air pressure. So they've got the technology to do that. Now, once you've got a bag full of satellites or old dead satellites, what do you do with it? Well, the obvious thing is you send the contents down into the atmosphere to burn up. 
that's how we dispose of everything in space right now. Either that or we put it up in a, in a graveyard orbit. You have a very, very high satellite orbit, you just stick them up even higher and get them out of the way. But everything else, ultimately, you try to get it down into the atmosphere. That actually is not all that efficient. You use up a lot of fuel doing that. So there have been studies by them and another company called Think Orbital. And they're saying, well, take the objects to an orbiting processing plant and recycle them. And the intent there is to open up space manufacturing. Now, this is kind of a little more down the road kind of stuff, but they're saying, let's get started down this path. NASA had done a study on orbital debris removal, and I covered that back in April. And they talked about this technology of basically recovering the metal in particular, like aluminum. There's a lot of aluminum used, and you can certainly reuse that. And they said, actually, it would be pretty low cost. It's a bit of a stretch technologically. So these people are saying, well, let's keep working on this. And that's what they're doing. Think Orbit, the company that would do the processing, they've been funded by the Air Force. That's actually part of a program they have called ISAM, which stands for In-Space Service Assembly and Manufacturing. Now, why are they interested? Well, one, they're interested in the defense industrial base. But of course, you think about it, if you can assemble something or you can tear it apart for parts, that you can also use that in space work. There is no distinction between what you can do for legitimate civilian use and what you might need to do in a military situation. You can disassemble somebody else's satellite, whether they want you to or not. So they have some incentive for doing that. But anyway, either way, we're trying to work out how do we get rid of orbital debris. Now, this is from Think Orbit. What they're showing here would probably terrify almost anybody that had a satellite, because here's a space tug in the left-hand side that has grabbed a hold of a satellite that presumably has some problem. They're taking it to this facility run, in this case, by this Think Orbital company. And of course, they just changed their slide to show well, if it's a transaster, a bag of old satellites, you know, it would look like this. Either way, you have this facility that clamps onto it and, and does whatever it's going to do, but mostly it's doing a lot of melting. Okay, our next topic is about geosynchronous satellites, large satellites that are up in orbit. Geosynchronous means they're in a 24-hour orbit, or it takes 24 hours around the Earth. As a result, it's matching the Earth's rotation, and if you're at the equator, that means you actually look like you're at a fixed point in the sky. So there's a lot of use for that. Broadcast TV or even internet use where it's mainly pretty much one direction. We don't need a lot of interaction. It's pretty popular for that. You don't need very many satellites to cover most of the Earth. This particular one here, a constellation of three to cover most of the Earth. Now, if you're off the equator, if you're not circling exactly the equator, you still get sort of that effect, but you're not exactly fixed. So there's a long history of these, and there's, I don't know, at least 130, 140 up there even just in the equatorial orbit, there's a lot of them. But where has the growth been? The growth has all been in low Earth orbit. And this is a picture from a Congressional Budget Office study. This is going only out to 2021, where you can see the geo satellites, they've been growing very, very slowly over time, but the big growth is really in low Earth orbit. And Starlink is actually a noticeable part of that. Now that was back in 2021. Now since then, this graph would look even more dramatic because Starlink alone has more than 4,500 satellites, which is the height of this entire graph. So clearly everything is going more that direction. But let's talk about a particular example here. Viasat 3. Viasat is the company. Viasat 3 is their latest series of high orbiting satellites. This is what it looks like. It has huge solar arrays. In their case, they have something unusual. They have this huge reflector, which really helps them focus on individual customers. They try to have a few large customers. They launched the first of these back in April, and it was somewhere between 700 million and a billion dollars. That's kind of typical for these kind of satellites. They're big and heavy. This one is 144 feet across, counting the solar cells. So you know they're big, six metric tons. The biggest one up there is from EchoStar. One of their competitors has used that. They put that up, and that's more like nine metric tons. Metric ton being a uh, thousand kilograms. Well, not that different than a U.S. ton. Huge data capability. 25 kilowatts of power, so it's a big thing. There's a problem though with risk. They had a failure. ISAT 3, that antenna, it didn't deploy. Probably a total loss. They're not sure about that yet. That's a billion dollar loss. And of course, insurance covers part of that. They're insured for up to 420 million. They haven't filed it yet because they're not sure what they're going to do. They've been hit by another one. They also own the Immersat satellites. They had one launched in February. They just announced on August 24th that that one's probably dead too. Um, this is a power problem, not an antenna problem. And actually, they've had a problem with antennas before. Back in 2018, they lost 15% of capacity from something not deploying properly. Insurance paid them $180 million. So why am I stressing insurance? Well, like any other business, 
know, there's big risk. You tend to have insurance and insurers have been dropping out. Most of the big ones don't even insure anything anymore up in space. So typically it's been teams of small uh, insurers. But if Viasat really pursues these claims, even more might drop out. So make it harder and harder to insure these big satellites. Now, the low Earth orbit constellations don't have that problem. Individual satellite doesn't cost that much. And they're mass produced that are cheap to make anyway. And if you lose one, it's not a big deal. It's a small part of the overall capacity of the system. Even if you lose an entire launch, say 22, 50 satellites, if you're a SpaceX, it's annoying, but it's not really that big a deal. Whereas if you lose one satellite out of the three you're putting up and each one's a billion dollars, it's a big deal. So there are other limitations for the uh, geosynchronous satellites, most of them because they're up so high. The big thing is transmission delays. You end up with about a half a second delay, which kind of kills most interactive use of the internet. It doesn't sound like much, but it makes a huge difference. The other thing is the power it takes. There's an inverse square law there that the power you need to get from point A to point B goes up proportionally to the square of the distance. So the further and further away you get, the more and more power it takes. Also, if you're taking photos, if you're doing Earth observation with photos or with radar, you actually have a resolution issue. You simply can't resolve points very, very close together. And so it's actually not quite as good for spy satellites either. And of course, it just costs a long time to design and build these things. Even launching them, it takes a Falcon Heavy to get these things up there. The Space Force is also worried about this a lot. They've got 10 really big reconnaissance satellites up in high orbits. And they're typically one to three billion dollars each. They're not all in geosynchronous orbit. Some of them are actually in elliptical orbits that are up at that kind of an altitude, but they're not exactly a spherical orbit. They realize how vulnerable they are. And the words they've been using kind of uniformly is they're big, juicy targets. And the Chinese kind of highlighted this for everybody. They grabbed a satellite, one of their own satellites, that was up in geosynchronous orbit. They just grabbed it with a robotic arm and moved it. You know, they moved it up to a graveyard orbit and kind of made the point. Now, the reality is we've done the same thing with Northrop Grumman. They have a craft that could do that kind of thing too. But the thing is, if you can do that, you can move it, you can turn it so it can't do what it's supposed to do. You can block its solar cells. You could snip off the, you know, the solar array. Lots of things you could do. Basically, you could do a lot of damage pretty easily. So besides mechanically damaging a satellite, you might just interfere with the radio transmissions. If you come up right next to it, you can block it pretty effectively. There's laser blinding or kinetic weapons. So not as likely to use that because that messes up everybody's satellite. But all these things have been demonstrated by China, Russia, the U.S., and to some extent, India. And one way it shows up is that there's stalker satellites up there. And there, people worry about that. You find that you have your own satellites. And this other one that was put up there, probably by Russia or China, is kind of following along. The threat is if they ever came to a shooting war, they could easily, before you could do anything about it, they could take out your satellite. So... That is actually a big concern. They're up there. Um, and of course, well, the Chinese have also complained that we've done that. So this is, just, this is just the way it is up there. So they're talking about migrating away from the geo-orbit satellites, but gradually. It has to be gradual. They've got years and years of stuff in the pipeline already, contracts. They have the whole next generation of, of reconnaissance satellites for missile warning already in progress, and that'll be out at least to 2030, if not beyond. But they're saying any newer contracts will not go for those large satellites. There's still an unresolved question about, do you try to defend your few large ones? You know, do you put something up there to block stalker satellites or whatever? What will happen is the existing satellites that are up there, like this one that I've got in the, in the picture here, they're good for at least 10 more years, unless they've used up all their fuel in trying to evade stalker satellites. And that actually is one of their concerns is that you don't want people coming in too close and you know getting the intelligence or even understanding what you've got. So when you see a satellite moving toward you, you tend to move away from it. Well, you can't do that indefinitely. You run out of fuel. And they're afraid that these satellites were designed years and years ago, back when nobody thought about this as a problem. Now it's a problem. The Ukraine war showed low Earth orbit benefits, cheap low Earth orbit satellites. So Ukraine, for instance, quickly adopted to even to using Starlink for targeting and drone control. And it turned out that Elon Musk has actually kind of tried to stop that. But a lot of it still happened. And we're still using a lot of commercial satellites as well. But the big point is there's resilience. Somebody could take out a satellite, one or two satellites, it really doesn't matter much. Russia did try jamming, but they've only partially succeeded in doing that. And they didn't even try to destroy the satellites because they realized, you know, there's just too many, they can't get them all. So what they want is more small satellites. The applications are specifically missile detection and tracking, 
and also tactical support, even communications between units, targeting and navigation. So the goal is a large network of small satellites, resilient because you can't knock out all the satellites in a, in a constellation. They weigh a lot less, so they're easier to get up to orbit more cheaply. And as I said, well, we are purchasing commercial services as well. The agency that's really spearheading this is called the Space Development Agency. They were actually around a little bit before Space Force was formed. The Space Force has taken it over. And their goal is to support all military operations in space and doing it quickly. And they're really saying they want to be disruptive. They want to produce a new product every two years, kind of a spiral development kind of an approach. They even kind of rebranded themselves. The Space Development Agency, SDA, they're saying means speed, delivery, and agility. That's, that's from their homepage. It shows you where they're coming from. They're, they are trying to be disruptive. So they started a satellite constellation in low Earth orbit. They have 28 satellites up there. Some of them were just launched. Four of them are for missile tracking, the rest are for communication. But they're mainly for right now for testing and demos and so on and training people. Next year, they're going to get operational. Now, what they want to do is tie in with existing tactical data systems. Currently, we have a thing called Link 16. They're pretty much line of sight communications, which is kind of limiting. So this connects everything worldwide. They're up about 600 miles, so they got much better sensitivity. There's fast response, of course, because they're in low Earth orbit. And well, actually, one thing you don't think about so much, but in low Earth orbit, it's a lot less radiation than yours way up at 22,000 miles. And so the radiation hardening issue isn't as big a deal. So in their plans, next year, they'll put up another 160 satellites in this network. And they're shooting for about 1,000 in the next few years. And that'll be mixed low Earth orbit and medium Earth orbit. And they're going to spend about $4 billion next year on this. So it's a big effort. Okay, getting near the end of the news here. The FAA, of course, has been investigating the Starship launch back on April 20th. And you probably remember that. We put a lot of beach sand and concrete all over the countryside there. One thing that came out is the extent to which propellant leakage was actually a problem. I hadn't realized the extent of that. That that caused a lot of fires, apparently which ended up severing a lot of communications links. And as a result, the flight computer couldn't even communicate with the engines anymore. That's part of the reason they lost control as fast as they did. They, on their own, had already figured a lot of this out. They've taken a lot of corrective actions already. But the FAA has closed the investigation saying, okay, all you've got to do is fix 63 different things. Now, they've said they fixed 1,000 already. So hopefully there's a lot of overlap. Engine and booster testing, you know, they had a problem that not all their engines really worked all that well. Um, launch pad robustness. You're looking at a lot of the launch pad right there in that picture. They don't want that happening again. So, of course, they have that water quenching system in there now. The flight termination system, which didn't work, which is a critical safety feature, that one they definitely fixed up. But a lot more explosives up there to destroy the rocket when they need to. And leak prevention, so we don't have a problem with the, you know, the fires. And Elon Musk says they're ready for launch. The Starship is fully stacked and ready to go. So what they're waiting for is the FAA to give the final approval and a new license. They had to modify the license. And they have not said when that will be, but um, I guess the next step here is that SpaceX has to show that they have met all the corrective actions. One last thing. It's kind of a golden age for science experiments on the International Space Station. People complained for a long time that not much was happening up there. Part of the problem was it was hard to get people up there because we depended on just a couple of Soyuz launches from the Russians. Now that we have much more reliable and cheap access to the space station, we have more crews, we have more cargo. There's a lot more going on. Here's just one example of it. A company has 3D printed some human tissue. In this case, it was an e-meniscus, and they brought it back. And they say it really works better in microgravity. You try to do this on Earth, and you just kind of get a puddle, whereas you know, you're not limited by gravity. You can create much more elaborate structures. They brought it back, and I mean, apparently it worked. The next experiment is going to be uh, doing cardiac tissue. And obviously the long-term goal here is they want to be able to 3D print hearts and things. And, you know, they think they can do this in orbit a lot better because of the microgravity. It's just harder to do these things on Earth. That's what their goal is. So at this point, um, we just review quickly how many launches there have been. So how many launches do people think there have been? Okay, you're, you're all pretty close. The answer is 20. It should have been a little bit higher, but the hurricanes kind of got in the way. These look typical. Every month we see the same thing. You know, China launches a bunch of military satellites. Russia launches an occasional one, or at least they launch something bringing cargo to the space station. North Korea launched a military spy satellite again. 
This one failed. It was up in the third stage. So they're, they got the first two stages working. There's a whole variety of constellations you probably never heard of, satellite constellations going up. A lot of them are Chinese. For instance, this one that was put up by Galactic Energy in China. There's 130 satellites in whatever constellation this is. It's an Earth observation kind of thing. They're up there. They're going in all the time. All the American are Falcon 9. Pretty much. Every now and then you get an electron for the small ones. Yeah, there's one here. The Capella space satellites. And actually, one thing to highlight about that is they finally used an engine that had been used before. They're getting into the reusability business. Uh, they promised it for a long time, and now they're actually making it happen. Not only is the engine reflown, but they said this entire first stage for the first time is actually going to be reusable. They're making progress there. Yeah, it really comes down to if you want to launch, there's SpaceX and there's Electron. They're the only two that actually have reliable access to space at this point. Everything else is waiting on the next generation of rockets, which will eventually compete with the you know, Falcon 9. Okay, going along here, um, India, you know, continuing, they launched a solar probe. Uh, this is going to the Earth-Sun Lagrange point. One. Again, highlighting that they are definitely in the space business here. We talked about the military satellites going up. Yeah, the, the Chinese are doing things like launching things on barges. Uh, they have kind of a shortage of launching places. And they're building them, and, but they're also trying to speed things up by doing things like launching on barges. Anywhere they can, they're figuring out how to launch stuff. And that's why there are so many uh, Chinese flags here you know, on this. Okay, uh, that's it. Yeah, in all other space-related videos or slide presentations by me are available at the link shown here. That includes a web page and also a list of videos at my YouTube channel, so you can view them or subscribe for notifications about future videos. These presentations are mostly made as part of the meetings of National Space Society's North Houston chapter, and the link to that is shown. Topics like these are presented as part of a monthly news segment and there are also lots of other interesting speakers and open discussions. You can attend in person or online via Zoom. Come join us.